I'm Veronique, Director of Marketing at Edify Technologies. Today, we start our Coffee Breaks Cold Brew Edition with three sessions we broadcasted during the Wells Month earlier this winter. First, Charles Tablet will discuss how to reveal fatigue cracks in structural welds using ACFM. Then, Fred Reverdy's French Coffee Break will be focused on weld inspection using TFM Multigroup with Capture 3.2 and Gecko. Finally, my colleague Stuart Kenny in UK will show you how to use links to scan actual wells. If you have any questions or comments after watching this video, contact us at info at edify.com. Thank you. First, uh, the agenda real quick, I'm going to <clears throat> introduce the topic. So fatigue cracking and structural steel in general. Uh, we're going to also talk about the NDT uh, on welds and uh, in such conditions more specifically. And then uh, the, we're going to talk about the ACFM option for uh, the inspection of such things. We'll go over a few applications and then conclude real quickly. So uh, fatigue cracks in welds, uh, what does that mean? First, let me introduce the, the topic real quick. You see, uh, you know, um, I w fr from uh, childhood, I was always amazed by the wonders of uh, human engineering, you know, engineering at all for what that is. And uh, you see those, uh, it's always amazing to see those huge structures like ships, uh, bridges, or, or, or cranes, or such uh, constructions uh, transport heavy loads, get beaten up, like uh, in the case of ships by waves, in the case of uh, bridges by, you know, just the weather, just the, the loads that gets on them. And, and still, you know, they look invincible, they, lo they look un unbreakable, but unfortunately, uh, the sad truth is that they fail, you know. So uh, ships, for instance, you know, uh, they, they, uh, they fail, you know. An example here for, for a, a cargo ship uh, that, that basically broke in half, you know, if you look on, on Google, for instance, you'll find a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, the example of, of bridges uh, that fail uh, and people get killed. Uh, sad story, but true. And then for uh, hoist systems, cranes and all that, uh, there are cracks that form. So if you see, you know, the, these, uh, the reasons why that happens uh, are multiple, you know, engineering errors, manufacturing errors, uh, just, you know, operational errors, uh, fatigue, corrosion. Uh, those are all uh, reasons why such uh, structures fails. But uh, in reality, if you look at the details, fatigue cracks in the welds are very important in, in such failures. Actually, depending on the source, uh, it's between 80 and 90% of the failures uh, in welded engineering components that are caused by such uh, fatigue cracks in welds. And happens on stationary equipment. We, we just saw the bridges, for instance, you know, uh, thermal cycling, variable loads, uh, they, 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 uh, they are the reasons why it occurs. Uh, in such cases, obviously, they're a bit more predictable over time than mobile equipment. So mobile equipment uh, gets unpredictable loads. We're talking about either, uh, you know, the example of the ship that we've seen already or the cranes, uh, they, they can get uh, unpredictable loads, uh, unpredictable, so therefore unpredictable fatigue failure. And, you know, uh, it, they're a bit more critical because of that. Um, and the main factors that influence fatigue cracks formation are, for instance, you know, not limited to, but lack of fusion, also the shape of the weld and lack of penetration. So we see a lot because of uh, welding uh, failures or uh, welding uh, errors. Also, design flaws can provide sites for crack formation, which is also a big factor. Again, not uniquely. Um, so how did that, does that happen? Because you see those structures seems unbreakable. You knock on them, they, they, just, they just seem impossible to, to break. But uh, the science behind fatigue cracks, a lot of you already know, but for, for some who don't, is uh, really well known, you know, very well covered by science and in short, in general, uh, very quickly. Uh, there's different stages. Stage one, which is the initiation, uh, if, is basically forming from those imperfections we talked about. Uh, they start very, very small. Uh, there's a, another way uh, which they, they start as well, 
is uh, with stress, obviously, there's plastic slip that occurs at the uh, microstructural level in the material. So basically, surface grains will start uh, to slip from one another. And this is how those micro cracks form. In this case right here, you see the crack is at about 10 micrometer, which is extremely small in that case. Um, and the growth is quite slow at that, uh, at that level because, you know, the part still has a lot of its structural integrity. Uh, and then when you get to stage two, two, we're talking about growth. So basically with repeated fluctuation and loading, uh, the crack expands, grows, uh, gets longer, deeper, and it, it, it gets uh, very, uh, I would say, uh, preferably oriented to uh, in an uh, orientation which is normal to the tensile strength. So, so basically the, the stress which is applied on the part. And, you know, the growth depends on various factors, uh, not going to all of them, but uh, the big, the big, big deal, though, is that if you do nothing, you end up with failure, which we, which we call fatigue failure. In this case, uh, fatigue failure caused by cracking. Um, basically, the remaining area becomes insufficient, so the structure doesn't do its job anymore, and it's possible that there's a sudden collapse or failure of the structure. Um, so what can be done for that? There's, you know, NDT in general is uh, the way to prevent that from happening. NDT, non-destructive testing, uh, obviously, for those who are not uh, used to this. A couple of options without going too much details. Uh, visual inspection uh, can be used uh, to, to see uh, the cracks when it's possible. Radiography as well, which is a little bit like what you get with... Uh, uh, when you get the broken bones, you know, uh, radiography is going to see through metal, see defects. There's also advanced UT ultrasonics, which is the uh, industrial version of the of what you uh, use to see, you know, uh, fetus in the womb. Uh, magnetic particle testing and penetrant testing, which are uh, kind of enhanced visual uh, techniques to see uh, cracks, which are revealed in the case of magnetic particle testing. Uh, by the magnetic flow interacting with a, a liquid that you put on the surface, and also the electromagnetic technique. So ET in the past stood for eddy currents, but now it's a bit wider. So without going in all the details of what makes these inspection techniques good or bad, you know, it depends on the condition, depends on a lot of things. Let's review what are the usual challenges in uh, inspecting welds on structural uh, elements like such. So uh, in reality, most of those are uh, built in complex and varied geometries. Uh, it's also usually coated, you know, and rusty and dirty in the cases you see there. They're, they're usual existing cases and they all feature such, uh, such challenges. Very often, you know, compared to some other industries, the welds are often very coarse and rough. So, you know, they uh, you, they're, they're not perfect welds, you know, with a, a shape uh, uh, which is easy to, to deal with, you know. Uh, also, access sometimes can be very difficult. If you think, uh, for instance, in a, in a bridge, you know, perhaps rope access or uh, robotics deployment is necessary. Uh, and then the environmental constraints, which aren't to, to be neglected. Imagine inspectors uh, being challenged with cold, rain, uh, the weather, and all that. Uh, they don't. An inspector doesn't have all his mind concentrated on the inspection job in those conditions. So this is the reality of such uh, uh, inspections, right? Now, uh, there's a key story I want to talk to you about. Uh, is the story of offshore oil and gas structure. So if you look back in the 80s, they had fatigue crack issues, which is right in line with this topic right here. Uh, the, you see that just on the picture, you know, these are structures that go underwater. Uh, they sustain heavy stress, you know, and, and uh, beating by the waves, by the elements and all that. So yeah, they, they, they had issues, they had uh, accidents back in the days and the existing NDT methods uh, back then uh, left much to wish for. If you talk about the MPI, for instance, which is depicted here on the lower right end, uh, it requires extensive cleaning, coating removal, 
Uh, you don't get uh, the, the crack depth sizing, which matters a lot in, the, in these uh, structures. You know, uh, 25 millimeter wall thickness is very common, can get even thicker than that. So um, not knowing how deep crack extends is, is, is you're missing a lot of valuable information that cannot help you to, uh, to define the remaining life, right? So uh, also, you know, uh, some, some are pretty deep, requires ROV deployment, MPI can, can, could not be done that way. Also, a decurrent testing back in the days, uh, it was poorly modernized. You know, that application requires underwater uh, fitness, you know, so uh, the, the inspection is done by ROVs or divers, depending on how deep. And it was basically too sensitive for underwater deployment. Uh, the conditions are pretty difficult. Scanning cannot be perfect. Welds are rough, so you, you end up getting over calls. It's like you see more noise than actual uh, flaws that matters. Uh, and also, depth sizing is not really reliable and, and basically too limited for this application, which, which requires, uh, I would say, deeper um, um, crack assessment, right? And then also, you know, very interestingly, ACPD, which is now a completely forgotten technique, uh, was pretty good at sizing, you know, the length and the depth, but it required to be on bare metal. So a lot of additional work required to, to get to that bare metal uh, made it very difficult to apply underwater. So in response to that, the uh, big oil and gas uh, companies back in the days uh, kind of funded the development of a new solution, which is called ACFM for uh, Alternating Current Field Measurement. Uh, that was developed back in the days in the University College of London, uh, where they did all the, the technology development, you know, probes, instruments. There's even a mathemat mathematical model for sizing uh, that backs it up. And all that was... Uh, was uh, was uh, validated in full with substantial investments. They created this uh, these uh, members, you know, that uh, uh, that are pretty similar to the actual uh, constructions, and basically actuated the members so that fatigue crack will form. So the the, the these uh, are uh, were made in uh, intense and very similar to the real problem. And full studies for. POD, uh, possibility of the uh, probability of detection uh, for sizing as well were done, and uh, the technique proved to be uh, very good and superior to anything that existed back then. So uh, that made the CFM real fit for this, you know. So it's a technique essentially born for this kind of problem. Uh, which is still talking about uh, fatigue cracks and welds, right? Uh, for structural elements. So uh, the advantage of uh, that technology is that you, you inspect as is, no need for surface preparation. The scans are fast. Uh, the coverage is large for each scan. Even the pencil probes cover 15 millimeters. So for any welds, uh, even the pencil probes, which are very good for uh, very varied uh, shapes and complex geometries can be used without spending too much time scanning and also up to 90 millimeters with array probes. It's known to be very rugged and forgiving. I mean, uh, by that, I mean that if you deploy with robots or rope access or uh, the scan is difficult, you know, you're still going to detect the cracks if the scan is not perfect. So uh, it, it, the reputation is very good for that. Also, you know, for... Uh, Difficult conditions, you know, it's very user friendly, pretty much plug and play. You don't need to calibrate on site. So there's not much of a, I would say, a operator dependence when using that technology. And also the sizing capability is critical for, you know, uh, the remedy. So if you can repair or not, you'll see it with, uh, with sizing and, you know, all the uh, other good stuff like uh, all the, pro uh, the, the proven uh, reliability and POD for that technique was done through several trials, several uh, studies. Uh, and also it's in most regulatory bodies. You see them on the right. Good mix of uh, uh, everything offshore, uh, uh, maritime, and also uh, top side, which means, you know, everything else uh, like bridges or whatever. Um, and then uh, versus, you know, when you come, you, we all... all we very often compare uh, this with uh, MPI and, you know, the the benefits of modern technology with modern software is you get inspection planning reporting and the data is auditable for historical management, for instance. 
couple of applications, you know, real life applications. Let's start with uh, 10 car inspection with ACFM. Uh, that's a very interesting one I didn't know before uh, a couple of years ago, you know. Uh, so basically, the application's essential. You see that these are on the railroads. They carry uh, heavy loads. They're in motion, you know. So there's a lot of stress on some of the of the wheels. And they, they, they actually fatigue. And they, they, there's cracks. And there's been, there's been accidents as well. Uh, you know, mo most people don't not aware of those things, but... Uh, their spills of dangerous cargo uh, occurs and occurred in the past as well. So uh, there's it's a big deal for everybody, you know, uh, for uh, the operating companies, for the government, for the people. Uh, essentially, there's fines associated with that. Uh, the company is uh, bound to some social responsibilities, uh, reputation, and you know the the fines, the maximum fines usually apply for that. The main technique used right now is MPI, uh, and it's not ideal, really. Uh, we, we have been uh, close to that case, and uh, if you consider that just in North America, there's more than than 130 thousands of these that require inspection roughly each 10 year. Uh, that's a lot uh, of welds to inspect. That's a lot of welds to make sure they're fit for uh, for uh, for duty, right? And that is uh, inspection. That inspection is cold covered as well. I'm not going to go into details for that. Uh, another uh, thing to consider is, you know, to use ACFM in lieu of MPI for this. Uh, we've worked really. We've worked on this for uh, past couple of years. And if you consider M that MPI requires grid blasting and a recall, that's about six hours worth of work. Uh, it's they, they usually do two of these tank cars in parallel, and that way they can do uh, eight tank cars per day. With ACFM, roughly one to two hours per tank cars. So, you know, the cost savings are quite substantial. Uh, one inspection is roughly 6,000 USD. So, you know, if you consider the eight tank cars per day, that's $36,000 saved per day. Uh, to to make sure everything's okay, right? Uh, the other benefits, obviously, you know, it's uh, the the ACFM is field proven. You know, we've done a lot of uh, field trial, comparative trials uh, on actual tank cars, and uh, you know, the the improvement in uh, reliability, POD or probability detection is is very very important. Uh, and the fact that you don't need paper anymore, it's all organized data with uh, the inspection records available for all to see, uh, the depth sizing as well, uh, it helps in the repair process. And then considering everything uh, with uh, uh, with the fact that the chemicals you, you would use with MPI, the cleaning, the grid blasting and all that. So it's a bit more ecological for sure and more sustainable. So the same equipment can be reused uh, indefinitely. Another quick example is about the steel bridges. Uh, actually, this is something I'm starting to open my eyes on. Uh, it, it, the, the the bridge actually, you know, everybody knows it's uh, their structural integrity are critical to uh, to public safety. That's for sure. And you know, there, there's I've seen pictures. I've seen. Uh, uh, I haven't seen it in real life. Uh, that would be too scary for me. But really. Uh, the I-beam, the buck section girders, uh, junctions are really prone to fatigue cracking. Uh, and the dominating inspection method right now is visual on something which is usually, usually very uh, thick coated. So uh, sometimes you see cracks which are just uh, enormous, uh, for se several uh, feet long in some case. That's, that's scary to me anyways. Uh, ACFM obviously being a natural uh, replacement for those uh, uh, that makes the whole thing a bit more, uh, um, uh, I would say, uh, 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 reliable and safe, basically. So uh, the bridge inspection trend is a bit amazing. To I uh, just uh, just learned about that. Uh, there's something like six thousand steel bridges, more than that, in the world. And uh, it's highly regulated and scrutinized, but really the current situation is a bit worrying. Uh, it, it, there's not, you know, you, you see a lot of cracks that should have been detected way before. So uh, there's a lot of improvement required in this uh, in this field right now, in my opinion. 
and you know uh, it seems like my idea of the topic is uh, is in line with the global bridge inspection market which is uh, uh, the, the predictions that are that is going to grow by about by about 100% over the next decade to a total capitalization of 6.3 billion so it shows that you know people are opening their eyes you know the uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 governments are uh, taking action uh, and you know there's place for better inspections and better safety for the people around the world with better NDT uh, again, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to be short in time soon. So really quickly, obviously, the same advantages of using ACFM and of MPI. So you know, with, with that, you're going to see what the eyes don't. A bit more presentive. You know, you're not going to start seeing cracks when they're when it's too late. Uh, and also, it also works very rugged, works through thick coating and rust. It handles, you know, with those uh, nice pencil probes and uh, it handles complex geometries. And uh, oh, that, that tells me to stop there. <laughs> Sorry for this. Okay, so uh, I'm going to conclude real quickly. Uh, you know, so uh, obviously uh, ACFM has been used already for, for uh, bridges and we look for seeing it more and more in the field. Um, I, I just give you a couple of applications, but Applications are, are, are numerous. You see uh, it's used on ships, uh, underwater, on offshore rigs, uh, anything that require underwater inspection, the storage tanks as well. Uh, there's an interesting application with high temperature uh, components, especially in process plants. Uh, the, you know, uh, an application I learned about is uh, hot tapping. So hot tapping, you know, when you do this, you need to make sure that the component is good before and after the job's done. We have uh, probes for high temperature with that. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty well installed in the railroad industry as well. Uh, used in uh, theme parks as well. You know, Disney World is a is a ACFM user. Just for your information, we talked about cranes and the hoist systems, and uh, and also heavy machinery like uh, in the mining industry or uh, others. Euh, donc là, je, euh, à l'écran, vous avez, je partage mon écran du Gecko. Euh, je suis connecté en Wi-Fi euh, à travers la clé Wi-Fi du, du Gecko. Vous avez ici la cale sur laquelle on va travailler. Et donc moi à l'écran. Euh, donc aujourd'hui, on va travailler, comme je l'ai dit, en TFM. Et je vais essayer de vous présenter un petit peu les nouveautés de la 3.2. Donc là, c'est le panneau d'accueil. Quelques petites nouveautés. Bon, euh, on a enfin accès au pourcentage de la batterie et à la température interne du Gecko. Donc ça, c'est un petit peu pour la, pour la page d'accueil. Euh, J'ai préparé aujourd'hui deux configurations. Une avec deux groupes euh, pour utiliser donc, les capteurs de chaque côté. Et une autre avec quatre groupes avec donc, deux modes de chaque côté aussi. Donc on est parti. Et je vais vous présenter un petit peu la configuration. Donc, euh, je vais vous montrer... Donc là, j'ai mon Gecko à 64-128, puisqu'aujourd'hui on va utiliser deux capteurs 64 éléments qui sont connectés sur le splitter que vous avez en haut. Et on va donc travailler sur une cale en acier carbone ici, de 25 mm d'épée, avec une soudure en V, 60 degrés, et trois défauts. Il y a de la fissuration en sommet de soudure, un manque de fusion le long des chanfreins, je crois que c'est de ce côté-là, et de la fissuration en racine. Pour les capteurs, comme je l'ai dit, on va utiliser deux capteurs 64 éléments assez standards, du 5 mm, euh, avec un pitch de 0,6 mm, euh, 5 MHz, pardon, euh, avec deux sabots à 55 degrés. J'ai déjà fait la calibration, donc euh, l'angle et hauteur. Euh, je ne vais pas la représenter aujourd'hui, vous pouvez la regarder sur les, sur les blogs. Euh, le scanner, donc c'est le Lynx, euh, dans sa version soudure. Donc le Lynx, il est fabriqué par nos collègues de Silverwing. Donc là, aujourd'hui, j'ai deux capteurs multi-éléments, mais je peux rajouter deux paires, une ici et une ici sur les côtés. Donc par exemple, si je veux faire du multi-élément avec deux paires de Toft, Donc, ce qui est pratique avec ce scanner, c'est qu'on n'a pas besoin d'outils. Euh, tout ici, c'est avec des vis. Donc vous pouvez enlever une des poignées ici, glisser des capteurs. De la même façon, vous pouvez changer le cadre pour mettre un cadre en corrosion, et tout ça se fait en cinq minutes. Donc c'est assez pratique. Donc, on va aller directement dans la configuration TFM. 
Hop, je me trompe d'écran. Alors, on a deux groupes. Donc, hop, on va faire comme ça. Donc déjà, ce que l'on peut voir, ce qui a changé un petit peu dans la 3.2, c'est la présence de ces annotations ici. Euh, donc là, en fait, c'est la distance entre le point de référence du, du sabot et le milieu de la soudure, donc l'index offset, euh, l'épaisseur. On a ici aussi euh, la numérotation des éléments pour vérifier qu'ils sont bien branchés au bon endroit. C'est assez, assez intéressant quand vous avez des capteurs DMA, deux capteurs matriciels. Une autre chose que l'on peut voir, c'est les angles que font les angles incidents avec le chanfrein. Donc ça, c'est disponible en multi-éléments, donc balayage linéaire, balayage euh, sectoriel, et aussi en PWI. Alors, parce qu'ici, en fait, on va faire de la TFM, mais à la place de faire de la TFM à partir d'une FMC, la Full Matrix Capture, où on va tirer tous les éléments un par un, donc là, avec un capteur 64 éléments, je tirerai 64 fois, on va faire du PWI, qui veut dire en anglais Plane Wave Imaging, mais en fait, c'est juste un balayage sectoriel que l'on voit ici, en utilisant tous les éléments, donc les 64 éléments, donc on en voit beaucoup d'énergie. Mais à la place d'utiliser un balayage sectoriel avec tous les degrés, on va ici utiliser des, euh, un, un pas beaucoup plus gros. L'idée, c'est vraiment de tirer moins de fois pour améliorer la productivité. Donc là, je crois que je tire 7 fois. Donc 7 fois comparé à 64 fois, on est en attente d'espérer de, un facteur de à peu près 9 en vitesse. Alors, l'autre chose qui, qui apparaît ici... Euh, c'est, euh, donc comme je l'ai dit, on a l'angle en fonction euh, du chanfrein. Donc si vous faites des multi-éléments traditionnels et que vous voulez par exemple euh, ajuster, donc là j'ajuste la distance du capteur, vous voyez en fait que ça se met à jour automatiquement. Et euh, donc là on a 0 degré, donc on est parfaitement normal au chanfrein. Donc c'est vert tant que c'est 6 degrés ou moins inférieur au chanfrein. Donc ça permet de rapidement euh, voir si notre euh, baillage sectoriel, après au demi-bond, est normal au chanfrein. Donc, sauf que là, en fait, c'est un petit peu différent. On va faire de la TFM. Donc, je vais revenir. Et donc, ce qui nous intéresse ici, au contraire, c'est d'être plus proche de la soudure. Parce qu'on veut rester dans le champ proche, puisque dans la TFM, on va focaliser partout. Donc là, j'en profite pour vous montrer un nouvel outil qui est disponible dans la version 3.2. C'est la notion de champ proche. Donc si vous regardez les rayons, et donc c'est aussi disponible en, en multi-éléments, vous voyez qu'il y a deux couleurs. Là ils sont rouges, et à certains angles, et certaines distances, si je dézoome, ils sont bleus. Tant qu'ils sont rouges, ça veut dire qu'on est dans le champ proche. Alors c'est intéressant pour la TFM, parce que la TFM on veut focaliser, et on ne peut pas focaliser dans le champ lointain. Donc tant qu'ils sont rouges, ça veut dire que je peux focaliser. Donc on voit ici, bah, partout, je suis rouge, donc je vais pouvoir focaliser partout dans la zone de la TFM. Par contre, on peut constater pour les angles élevés que c'est bleu, donc c'est-à-dire que je n'ai pas de focalisation, ce qui est logique en fait, puisque bah, c'est physique, c'est une limitation physique. Pour les, pour les forts angles, que ce soit en conventionnel, en multi-élément ou en TFM, bah, on peut dévier, mais on ne peut pas focaliser l'énergie, puisque vu de ce point-là, quand je regarde mon capteur, il apparaît tout petit. Donc je ne peux pas focaliser. Donc en fait, l'intérêt ici de la TFM, il est très limité. Donc c'est pour ça que ma TFM, ma zone TFM, je la commence un peu plus basse, plutôt que de commencer directement à 0 degré. Et on voit, bah donc, je vais pouvoir focaliser ici. Donc là, ce n'est pas très grave. Là, ici, ici, ici. On voit ici que bah, pour tous ces angles-là, je serai focalisé. Donc le seul endroit où je ne serai pas très focalisé dans ma zone TFM, c'est ici. Ce qui n'est pas très grave, puisqu'on va le contrôler par l'autre côté. Alors, un autre outil qui est disponible, c'est l'enveloppe. Donc l'enveloppe fait son apparition pour la TFM. Et l'enveloppe, elle est intéressante, donc, déjà d'un point de vue esthétique, euh, mais pour une autre chose, puisque pour la TFM il euh, y a un critère qui est apparu en plus dans les standards, que ce soit l'ASME ou l'ISO, qui est l'amplitude fidélité euh, ou stabilité dans l'ISO. En gros, ce critère-là euh, va déterminer si la discrétisation, donc la taille des pixels, est suffisamment petite pour ne pas perdre l'information en amplitude maximum. Donc si vous avez une trou génératrice par exemple, et que vous choisissez une grille, une grille trop grosse, ben, il est possible que vous perdiez le maximum de l'amplitude. Et cette, euh, les, les standards disent que vous ne pouvez pas perdre plus de 2 dB. Donc ça va, ça va fixer en fait une taille de pixels. Donc avant, quand on n'avait pas l'enveloppe, pour respecter ce critère-là, il fallait utiliser 161 000 pixels. Alors le problème de ça, ben, plus j'ai de pixels, plus ma vitesse de scan, donc ma productivité va baisser. Et là, ce qu'on peut voir, ben, quand j'utilise l'enveloppe, ça va faire basculer euh, mon nombre de pixels à 79 000, donc je vais euh, pouvoir utiliser beaucoup moins de pixels, donc aller plus vite. 
Euh, quelque chose qui est aussi intéressant dans cette version-là, et donc ça, 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 on va dire ça, ça se combine un petit peu à ce que je viens de dire, c'est que pour toutes les images TFM, donc pour chaque groupe, hein, euh, quand on a 93 000 pixels ou moins, dans la version 3.2, on a amélioré euh, le calcul euh, d'un facteur 60%. Donc quand on combine l'enveloppe et ça, donc ça nous permet en fait, d'aller beaucoup plus vite. Donc ça, c'était le premier groupe, donc c'était pour cette sonde-là, je crois, non celle-là. C'est la gauche. Et le deuxième groupe, ben en fait, c'est assez simple. Ça va être euh, exactement le même. Hop, je me trompe de... Ah, je suis reparti sur le même. C'est ça d'avoir deux écrans. Hop, voilà. Voilà. Ben, L'autre, c'est exactement la même chose. J'ai fait exactement le même groupe. C'est symétrique. Euh, donc, avec la même taille d'image et euh, les mêmes modes et tout ça. Euh, J'ai calculé la TCG pour les deux groupes, donc là comme pour du conventionnel et comme pour du multi-élément traditionnel, bah, on va faire une TCG, on va compenser pour les différents angles et pour la différente profondeur dans l'image TFM, donc ça c'est euh, bon, du classique. Hein. Alors une chose qui aussi est différente, j'oublie de préciser, donc avec cette configuration là de groupe euh, en regardant donc en direct et en demi bond des deux côtés, j'arrive à une vitesse d'à peu près 101 mm par seconde, on va dire 100 mm par seconde, ce qui est plutôt bien pour arriver à faire du contrôle manuel. Donc, une chose qui a été aussi revue en 3.2, c'est le panneau motion, donc le panneau de, de, de déplacement. Alors déjà maintenant, on a l'ensemble des groupes qui est résumé ici, donc que ce soit en TFM, en, en multi-éléments et ou en TOFT, ce qui permet en fait de voir le scan plan de chaque groupe, donc là de mon premier groupe et ici de mon deuxième groupe. Et donc si j'avais du TOFT, bah, je pourrais regarder aussi les différentes paires de TOFT et de voir la couverture de zone en fait de l'ensemble de ma configuration. Alors une autre grande différence aussi, c'est qu'avant on devait commencer nos scans à 0 mm, on commençait à 0, on allait jusqu'à je sais pas 500 mm avec un pas de 1. Maintenant dans la version 3.2 on peut commencer à n'importe quelle valeur, donc là par exemple je commence à 25, je vais à 255, je peux aussi faire l'inverse, je peux commencer à 255, aller à 25, donc ça permet en fait vraiment euh, d'aller dans les, toutes les directions sans avoir à recommencer à zéro. Et l'autre chose aussi qu'on a mise en 3.2 c'est la, euh, la polarité du codeur, maintenant on peut changer la polarité sans avoir à revenir dans ce menu. Donc par exemple si je vais directement dans le panneau acquisition, donc là, je suis en live avec mes deux TFM. Ah ben, ici, j'ai accès maintenant à... J'aurais dû mettre d'ailleurs l'interface en français, je m'en aperçois maintenant. Euh, on a accès maintenant euh, aux paramètres euh, du déplacement. Donc je peux, sans avoir à revenir en arrière, changer le début, la fin et le pas. De la même façon, ici, maintenant, je peux changer la polarité du codeur, ce qui fait que quand je vais tout scanner dans la même direction, ben, en gros, je peux incrémenter ou décrémenter. Voilà, donc là, bah, ce qu'on va faire, on va rajouter un peu d'eau. Voilà. On va se mettre d'un côté. Alors, j'ai mis des cales pour essayer d'être à peu près à même niveau. On va réinitialiser et on va lancer Play. Alors, je vais devoir me lever. Hop. Voilà, donc j'ai fait mon scan, oups, je suis en train de taper. Donc là j'ai bien acquis 100% de mes données, donc je vais pouvoir sauver et analyser. Hop, donc là on est parti en analyse. Donc on retrouve nos deux TFM, donc de chaque côté, nos C-Scan, nos A-Scan avec donc la TCG. Euh, donc là, ce que je vais pouvoir faire, en fait, c'est euh, montrer aussi quelque chose d'autre qui est apparu. C'est, en fait, on a rajouté du vidéo smoothing. Donc, euh, c'était pour faire plaisir aux gens qui trouvaient que les images n'étaient pas jolies. Donc, maintenant, on a euh, du vidéo filtering, hein, donc qui permet, en fait, de vraiment euh, avoir des images euh, plus jolies, même si les, les, les données derrière restent tout à fait les mêmes. Autre chose, avant, pour accéder aux options des différentes vues, il fallait cliquer ici. Euh, donc moi, ça va, j'ai des tout petits doigts. Par contre, euh, si on avait des doigts plus gros, c'était un peu plus ennuyeux. Donc maintenant, on peut accéder à ceci. Ça fait, on, on peut cliquer sur n'importe lesquels. Ou on peut aller directement ici. Il y a quelque chose qui s'appelle View Tools. 
et ça fait afficher en bas une barre d'outils de des vues qui s'adaptent en fonction des vues. Donc quand je suis ici en A-Scan, on voit que je n'ai pas du tout la même en C-Scan pour les amplitudes et ici sur mon image euh, TFM. Donc l'avantage que ces boutons sont plus gros et on a la barre toujours en bas, ce qui ne permet de ne pas cacher, de ne pas être limité. Et on peut la fermer ici et revenir sur la barre que l'on avait avant. Euh, là, en fait, ce que l'on a, on a donc sur la vue 3D, euh, comme on a pu le voir avant, on a toujours nos annotations. Donc là, il a déjà exporté en 3D les données d'un des groupes. Donc là, ce que je vais faire, c'est que je vais enlever les annotations, puisqu'il y en a un petit peu beaucoup, et je vais garder juste le plan d'inspection que l'on voit en noir. Et une des nouveautés là aussi que l'on peut faire maintenant, c'est exporter dans la vue 3D tous les groupes de la TFM. Donc on va faire un merge euh, des données dans, l dans la, la, la vue 3D. Donc ce que je vais faire, c'est que je vais aller éditer ma vue 3D, ici, et je vais lui dire, bah, à la place de me montrer le groupe 1, donc euh, un des côtés, montre-moi toutes les TFM sur la même vue. Et donc là, il est en train de recalculer. Et maintenant, on a accès à... Donc il a exporté les deux groupes directement dans la vue 3D. Donc là, on voit ici une vue de côté, une vue de dessus avec les différents défauts. Il y a un défaut ici, un là et un là, ou une vue euh, de côté. Et bien sûr, on peut aller jouer sur les seuils. Donc par exemple, si je veux voir uniquement ce qui est entre 50 et 100%, où je peux mettre l'échelle en BB, voilà, on va pouvoir seuiller. Donc ça, ça s'adapte en fait à la dynamique euh, en amplitude que l'on aura choisi. Donc là, je vais remettre sur 0. Voilà. Donc c'est assez rapide et c'est assez pratique pour l'exporter euh, dans les rapports. Donc voilà, donc ça c'était un petit peu euh, certaines nouveautés que, que, que l'on avait, euh, que l'on a d'ailleurs dans la version 3.2. Euh, et donc ce que je vais faire là, maintenant, c'est qu'on va les regarder sur. Euh, ah, J'arrive pas à cliquer sur le mauvais écran. Euh, on va aller regarder la configuration 4 groupes. Alors, 4, donc j'ai oublié de le préciser, mais avec la TFM, on a jusqu'à 4 groupes. Contrairement au multi-éléments, on en a jusqu'à 8. Alors, on va retrouver ici 4 groupes, donc 2 de chaque côté. Donc, les deux premiers sont exactement les mêmes que ceux que j'ai présentés, à savoir du TT en direct avec le direct ici et le demi-bon. Donc ce qui nous... En fait, ça nous permet de calculer le TT et le 4T, puisque quand on prend une image et qu'on prend le symétrique en bas, c'est comme du multi-élément classique. Ici, en fait, ça revient à calculer l'image 4T. Donc en fait, on a déjà deux modes ici, on a TT et 4T. Et l'autre chose que j'ai calculée ici, donc pour, la même, pour le même capteur, c'est le 3T. Donc là, on va définir une image uniquement dans la première partie de la, de la soudure. Euh, puisqu'en fait le 3T est un mode qui va forcer le rebond euh, sur le fond, aller sur le pixel, sur chacun des pixels, et revenir vers les récepteurs. Donc là on ne peut pas calculer les modes euh, 3T, 5T, et ainsi de suite, euh, en dehors de la pièce. Donc là donc on a le 3T pour ce côté-là, en enveloppe aussi. Euh, ça c'est le T, euh, TT donc, euh, de l'autre côté aussi, pareil, même chose. Okay. et je vais lui charger sa TCG voilà. et on a de la même façon le 3T de l'autre côté donc en fait on va calculer en même temps TT, 3T, 4T TT, 3T, 4T donc on va, cal on va calculer l'équivalent de 6 modes en fait en simultané alors bien sûr ça va avoir un impact sur la productivité puisque maintenant le système on va demander au système de calculer plus de pixels euh, donc à la, à la place d'aller à 100 mm secondes euh, pour les deux modes, euh, là en fait dans cette configuration là, on va être autour de 50, euh, un peu au-dessus de 50 mm secondes. Donc on va aller dans la panneau configuration, on va remettre un peu d'eau. On va se remettre là. Donc là on retrouve les deux images que j'avais tout à l'heure. Là, on va retrouver les quatre modes, donc le TT, le 3T, le TT, le 3T, sachant que l'image du bas, c'est le 4T. On va recliquer sur 0 et on va lancer l'acquisition. Alors, je vais y aller un peu plus lentement pour éviter de perdre des trames. Voilà. Tac. Et on va aller encore en analyse. 
encore une fois mon écran. Hop, cinéma. Voilà, donc on retrouve bah, les défauts qu'on avait tout à l'heure. Je pense que je n'ai pas été très droit sur ce scan-là. Donc par exemple ici, euh, on va retrouver euh, notre manque euh, de fissures. Donc voilà, bah, ce qu'on peut voir, c'est que normalement la fissure elle est de ce côté-là. Donc ce que je vais faire, c'est que je vais aller dans les offsets. Et maintenant, dans les offsets, on peut changer euh, les capteurs séparément ou on peut changer tous les offsets. Alors par contre, j'ai une chance sur deux. Euh, allez, on va penser qu'on est à... On va aller dans le bon sens. Voilà, on est dans le bon sens. En fait, c'est plutôt moins 3. Donc là, je change en fait les deux groupes, tous les groupes ensemble, je décale. On a ici donc notre mode TT. On peut voir qu'on a euh, une fissuration en racine que l'on voit. Enfin, elle se propage ici et après elle suit le chanfrein qu'on va détecter par l'autre côté aussi. Là, en le mode, euh, on va lui rajouter un peu de gain sur le mode 3T. Et on voit que l'on dessine un petit peu le défaut. Alors là, ce n'est pas, pas, un, pas une, un, un, de l'électroérosion, hein, c'est un vrai, une vraie fissure qui se propage. Donc on n'a pas une, une jolie euh, de chose dessinée. Euh, donc on peut essayer de bouger et voir un petit peu à quoi il ressemble. Voilà, donc là on voit un petit peu que ben, à la place de dessiner quelque chose de bien droit, on a un petit peu des échos un peu partout. Euh, ben ça c'est un, un peu lié à, à, la, à la forme réelle du défaut. Et de la même façon... Ici, euh, dans ma vue 3D, bah, si je veux, donc là j'exporte par défaut un seul mode, donc si je veux, je peux aller lui dire, bah, exporte tous les modes. Donc là il va exporter euh, les quatre modes, donc les TT, les 3T de chaque côté. Donc là il va tout recalculer, par contre ça prend un tout petit peu, ah non ça va, c'est assez rapide. De la même façon je vais enlever ça pour quand même qu'on puisse voir les choses. Donc là on a l'ensemble de nos modes qui sont, on va enlever, voilà, on a l'ensemble de nos modes, donc les TT, les 3T, de chaque côté, tout dans la même vue, et donc ça nous permet bah, de, euh, de voir plus rapidement tous les défauts, donc si on avait un pipe, on verrait tout ça en, en 3D, euh, et voilà. Um, so the contents of the presentation, um, just a short introduction, um, the uh, overview of the link scanner and the link scanner family, um, introduction to the axial attachment, as I mentioned, um, and being quite a short um, presentation today, we've got a short uh, live demo of three configurations that the link uh, scanner can be used in. So Silverwing is a uh, center of excellence is based in Swansea in South Wales. Um, the sort of product po portfolio that we've got at Silverwing are split into two categories. Um, a magnetic flux leakage or MFL. Um, we've got three main products in that with the Floormap X being our flagship product at Silverwing. Um, pipe scan HD and hand scan. Uh, and we've also got an integrated UT solutions section to the business. Um, and within this um, category, we've got the RMS, which is an automated corrosion mapping scanner. We've got the Scorpion 2, which is a robotic uh, scanner for UT collection on, on tanks. Um, the Link Scanner, of course, which we're going to talk about today. And also the, uh, the R Scan Array, which is a handheld manual corrosion mapping uh, scanner. So introducing the Lynx, uh, for those who haven't seen it, um, the Lynx is a, a relatively low cost but high spec uh, phase array toft uh, corrosion mapping and weld inspection solution. Um, we like to think of it as the Swiss army knife of, of UT scanners. Um, the reason being it, it, it has got great versatility. Um, so we were really keen for our customers to buy into this family, the Lynx family of scanners. Um, and to um, be able to cover multiple functionality with the same system. Um, we didn't want to go down the approach with one scanner for one solution. We wanted a family of scanners to cover a, a range of uh, advanced ultrasonic uh, methods. Uh, we believe it's a very robust system. It's been designed for rope access, um, drop tests to be able to make sure that it's robust in, in uh, aggressive environments. Um, it's very stable. Um, it's a dual bar arrangement on, on, on the scanner as opposed to a single bar passing through the tractors. We've got a dual bar arrangement which really does help with stability um, when, when you're considering um, scanning and probe placement. 
It's uh, IP66 rated for waterproof. It comes with a contactless encoder. Um, again, very robust, doesn't get um, damaged with, with impact. Uh, quite importantly, it's got integrated electronics, um, so the operator doesn't need to touch the instrument when they're, when they're scanning. Both in uh, weld inspection and in corrosion mapping mode, the uh, integrated electronics do different features, which I'll explain a little bit more about. Um, but the, the whole idea is to uh, avoid um, operators needing to interact with the instrument, the phased array instrument itself, and being able to do all, of the, all those commands uh, through, through the scanner. Um, and lastly, um, as, as an overall, um, within corrosion mapping mode, it's extremely low profile. Um, this, this was a quite an important design feature for corrosion mapping, um, considering um, uh, pipe work when it's heavily congested, when uh, there's two pipes closely, um, uh, close to each other, the scanner can, uh, can operate in, in, between, um, in between those small spaces. So some of the main features of the of, of the main body of the links, um, we'll start with uh, e easy to hold handles um, designed for um, uh, maximum grip, but also um, considering that clearance that I just mentioned. Um, so you've got a, a really good uh, area to be able to grip to the scanner, but we're not eating into that um, circumferential clearance that's needed when you've got congested pipe work. Um, we've got uh, encoder strain reliefs. Uh, we know from experience that the encoders uh, go down regularly. So uh, we've got uh, integrated encoder relief, uh, strain relief um, to protect the cables. Um, very strong mag magnets, um, Im important for safety purposes, of course, uh, but also helps with that stability and the, and the ease of scanning when you've got a strong, a strong magnetic tractors. Um, everything is um, toolless, um, including the tool posts. So uh, they're what, what we regard as quick release. So if you want to add tools to the main frame, uh, or tool posts to the main frame, or if you want to adjust the standoff positions of the tool post, then it's all quick release, and, and they slide quite nicely along along the main uh, frame there. Um, we've got um, integrated buttons, as I mentioned. Um, so if you're considering weld inspection, phased ray and toft, then the button will start and stop the scan and also pause the scan. Um, so that allows operators to be able to perform the inspection straight from the, from the uh, cradle itself, straight from the scanner itself, stop the scan and then save it on the instrument again without having to touch the, uh, the phased array system. Um, but also, uh, when you're operating in corrosion mapping mode, you've got a, an additional feature with the uh, electronics, which allows you to automatically stitch uh, data sets together. Um, so as you're incrementing your, um, your collection, the, the button on the system will do that for you. Um, we've got dual break, uh, dual break uh, mechanism um, designed to hold the scanner in place. Again, important for safety, um, particularly thinking of rope access. But even more uh, um, useful is, is operationally. If you want to reset your probes, if you want to check your coupling channels, you can use the braking system. The system locks in place and you can, and you can uh, do all those checks without the worry of the system falling off. Um, and, and as I mentioned, integrated in encoder, purposely designed, different to some of the other encoders that are on the market. Um, it's contactless. It takes its information from the wheels themselves as opposed to being in contact with the surface. And this really does help reliability with the impact of taking the scan on, on and off uh, a component. So some subtle uh, differences to our scanner to other ones that are available on the market. Um, they are subtle, but as an operator, they're very important. Um, I mentioned about the brake system. Um, you can see on the on the left hand side there, th those those brakes are actually at your fingertips. Um, very important. You can keep your hands on on the uh, on, on the tractor units on the handles there, and without having to try and manipulate, hold the scanner with one hand um, and, and lock the brakes in, into position. They're all they're all available at your fingertips. So hold the scanner in position on the grips, and you can clip that brake in, in, into place, and then do your, uh, your 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 changes to the standoff or whatever whatever you need to check. I mentioned about the dual bar uh, arrangement. Um, this gives the stability, but also allows the um, the tool post and the tractors to slide uh, to slide to different locations. Um, so, in a sort of standard uh, weld inspection, where you've got good access to both sides, then you can comfortably put the tractors either side of the weld. 
Um, but we know from experience on site that not all welds are, uh, are like that. We've got elbow supports, we've got, uh, um, we've got trunnion welds um, where you've only got access to one side of a straight pipe. Um, so very easily you can, um, you can slide the tractors in, into position to be able to suit the uh, configuration that you're testing. Um, we've got a center mounted uh, uh, center mount uh, for the probe. Um, now I mentioned about stability, um, but one thing that I'd like to emphasize here is how um, important that is when you've got a scope of work where you're looking at different diameter pipe. Um, from experience using other scanners um, on the market, um, when you go from one diameter to the other, it's very um, difficult sometimes to be able to get the probe in the correct position. Um, to make sure that the probe is normal to the surface, to make sure that you've got a good seal for your um, for your coupling channel. But when uh, with with the link system, because the probe's mounted in between the tractor units, um, going from pipe diameter to pipe diameter, you instantly get that normal um, orientation of the probe. So the setup time is is dramatically reduced when you when you've got a scope of work with different uh, configurations. Something again quite subtle but really important and and a big advantage uh, of of those um, center mounted probes. And I mentioned everything is toolless, so we've got uh, multiple uh, tool post arrangements, tractors. Um, all all of that can be rearranged um, from corrosion mapping into weld inspection, changing the configuration of your of your weld inspection, all can be done with, without having to uh, touch a tool. Again, uh, important feature when you're considering site conditions. So three main configurations of the links: corrosion mapping mode, weld inspection mode, and for those customers who are doing a bit of everything. Um, we we uh, we offer the links full, um, and with the links full, we we believe it's a great um, tool for non-intrusive inspection. Um, thinking of the main um, inspection methods that go with an NII survey, corrosion mapping, phased array of welds, toft of welds, all of that can be done with one system. You don't have to uh, take uh, multiple scanners on site with you. So the links full, we believe, covers a, a large a large variety of the um, the methods that are involved in in NII. So just quickly on the on the links WI on on its own, um, it, it covers four inch to flat plate uh, weld inspection, both in service and fabrication welds. Um, very popular for pressure vessel inspection for um, in-service uh, methods. As I mentioned, um, great um, versatility with the scanner. So um, if you have got pipe to elbow, uh, pipe to feature, um, straight pipe to straight pipe, very easy to, uh, to change the low, um, orientation of the tractor units and the tool post to cover a variety of different welds there. As, as standard, uh, it comes with uh, four um, tool posts with a typical configuration of two phased array in the center and uh, two toft on the, on the outside. Um, but we do offer it as a six probe arrangement as well. Sometimes if you've got heavy wall welds um, um, or very um, stringent criteria for, for inspection, then the, the requirement for a diff, uh, uh, an additional set of toft probes is needed. If you want to focus at different depths in the weld, then, uh, then you have got that option uh, with the six probe arrangement. Different um, uh, arms, uh, arm lengths, again, depending on, uh, on your world configuration. And these, again, toolless can be swapped in and out. Um, and, and the last one, as I mentioned, when uh, used in conjunction with the Edify Technologies phased array units, the Mantis and Gecko, you've got fully integrated control on board the tractor unit. Um, and in world inspection, it allows you to uh, uh, start and stop your scan. In uh, corrosion mapping mode, um, the, uh, you've got an extended tool, uh, tool, uh, a toolbar um, allows up to 500 mil of, uh, of coverage. Um, phased array corrosion mapping is very popular for vessel shell inspection, uh, storage tanks used quite extensively in the marine uh, in the marine industry, um, and uh, ship decks as well uh, is becoming quite popular with, with this method, mostly because it's, it's very portable. Um, battery operated, you get fully automated, uh, fully encoded high resolution data sets all through a portable battery operated system. 
Um, one one uh, nice feature that we've we've added to the Lynx corrosion mapping uh, links is the um, is a, a portable sight bag. Um, again, uh, using our experience from uh, from uh, inspections on site, it's very difficult with those large pelly cases to carry a scanner to uh, difficult locations. So, as a standard, we offer a, a sight bag to uh, to help uh, moving uh, moving around site. And I think it's just worth mentioning quickly the the top right image there that you can see on the display is uh, as a one by one high uh, high resolution corrosion mapping uh, image, uh, which gives a, a lot of information. Um, as well as the um, sort of standard um, operations, corrosion wrapping and weld, the Lynx WI is actually useful for flange face interrogation. Um, so uh, again, changing the scanner to suit a, a one-sided inspection, uh, you can house a probe on the tapered neck of a flange and record a, um, an encoded B scan to look for corrosion on the ceiling face of a flange. So it's, it's, a, it's a method to avoid splitting flanges open, look at, using visual inspection um, and using phase array to record data sets and size corrosion that uh, could affect the integrity of the seal. So that was a bit of an overview of the links, some of the different features and solutions that we that we uh, currently have available. Um, but yeah, um, the coffee break today is a short introduction into our uh, new attachment um, for axial scanning or seam weld scanning. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the of the coffee break, we wanted uh, the links to be a family with attachments to grow the functionality with with the same with the same scanner. Um, so we've introduced the, the axial attachment as an add-on to the Lynx WI. So you can still do your circumferential scanning. You still get all of the features, the low profile for um, circ, uh, circ scanning, uh, but with some slight modifications to the tractor units and an, an additional bracket, you can uh, rearrange the Lynx scanner to, get, uh, to do inspection on seam welds, uh, long seam welds. Um, so again, carries up to four probes, um, phase array and Toft combination. Um, the mechanical bracket allows for um, four inch OD and upwards, which is which is a great feature to have that uh, range of diameters for, for seam weld inspection. Um, we appreciate that with seam weld inspection, quite often there's long spools and it's important to make sure that the probes uh, remain um, uh, centered around around the weld. So there's a, um, a, a laser guide added to the top of, of, of the scanner. Um, this is, is a visual aid, um, so the operator can see a line of sight with the, with the, with the laser and follow the, follow the seam weld as, as, as they're scanning. It's worth mentioning, but I, I won't go into too much detail, but our um, capture software with the uh, M2M uh, instrumentation has got a compensation factor for um, uh, seam weld. So if you tell it the wall thickness and the diameter, um, the capture software is able to compensate for the curvature issues that, um, that are different if you're scanning circumferentially or, or on a flat plate. And again, um, everything is toolless. Um, so going from circumferential weld inspection to axial inspection, you change the bracket around and you can do that all without any, any tools. I know this was a short break and I only had 15 minutes, but I've got one more slide and then I'm going to give you a quick, uh, quick demo of the, uh, the features. So this is it. Um, all those customers who have already bought into the into the Lynx family, if they've got uh, Lynx weld inspection, um, they can buy this bracket as, a, as an accessory, and instantly they've got the uh, the option to be able to do seam welds. Um, if customers haven't already bought into the Lynx family, they can buy the Lynx WI um, with the, with the axial bracket, and they get that again. They get that um, the dual functionality. So it's a it's a, a ratchet adjustment lever. Um, so it's a mechanical grip that um, allows you to change from uh, through through the diameters. So the operator will control the the ratchet, set the uh, tractors to the to the diameter that they want to test, and 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 away and, and away they go. Um, as I mentioned, it's an it's an accessory, um, but it does come with its dedicated uh, case. So. Um, 
if you're if, if you're if you're buying into it you've already got the links you will get a dedicated case for for the axial attachment but that will fit into your site bag that, that I mentioned earlier um, so that's a very quick overview of the Lynx family, the introduction to the to the axial scanner. Um, I'm just going to uh, flip over to the to the other camera to give you a couple of uh, demos of uh, the the three main uh, functionalities. So I'm uh, bringing in my lovely assistant to help with this. This is uh, Gareth uh, Mugford. You can see his hands. <laughs> he's, uh, he's the product manager, the, the brains behind this, uh, this uh, scanner and, and also managing the, um, the, the additions that we're bringing out at the moment. So Gareth's currently operating the links in the uh, sort of the standard configuration as, as, as we see it, um, the circumferential weld scanner. At the moment, he's got the brakes on so he can uh, adjust the probes, uh, make sure that they're centered to, uh, to, to the weld. E even in the, uh, the three o'clock position, the, the, the brakes are strong enough to hold, to, hold, to hold the probes, to hold the uh, cables in position. And then simply when the, when the probes are in place, Gareth can unlock the, the, um, the brakes, uh, press a button, press a button, <laughs> and, then, and then scan. So again, um, probably the most standard configuration. The most that, we, that you know, the most of our customers are going for this one. Um, again, with the four-post arrangement, the two-phase array and the, and the two-toft. But few customers are buying the full system as well. So you can see um, if if Gareth comes around the pipe now. The addition is the longer arms and the uh, phased array corrosion mapping tool, uh, tool post that's mounted in, be in between the arms. So you can see with the corrosion mapping uh, system, you've got 500 millimeters of axial coverage. Um, the uh, probe slides uh, through the center of the, of the tractors there. There's um, uh, pivot pins across the uh, length of the, of the arms that allows you to click the probe in position when you're pulling your circumferential scan. And when you've completed your, your circ scan, then you, uh, then, you, then you pull the scanner back. Each time you're doing that, if Gareth can just show you the button press. So this is what I mean about data stitching. So uh, just a little bit of an explanation. I know I'm already over time. I'm sorry about that. Um, but the phased array probe covers about 50 millimeters um, with, with each pass. So every time Gareth's doing a circumferential pass, we're collecting a band of 50 millimeters. Then Gareth will move the, uh, the probe across the increments on the bar, press the button, and then the next 50 millimeters will be automatically stitched. So you get a full coverage and a full, fully, fully stitched C-scan at, at the end of it. And again, the bricks will lock in position. And Gareth can move on to finally You'll see the familiarity of the tractor units. The tractor units that are on the corrosion mapping and the weld inspection are now taken off the, the rail bar there and they're added to the axial bracket, which I showed in the presentation. The axial bracket is uh, um, manipulated to set the, uh, the, the tractors at an angle depending on the, um, the uh, pipe diameter. The lighting isn't fantastic in here, but I think you can just about see the laser guide traveling across the seam world. Yep, that's good. So the, the probes are, set, um, uh, uh, are placed in position. The laser guide is, is, is centered on the weld and quite simply with the same tractor units, the same uh, uh, functionality with the buttons, Gareth can start the scan and cover the seam weld.